Hi, everybody. Um, before I begin, uh, we got the privilege of getting you people to the, uh, to, to the lunch, actually. So I wanted to start with a little joke. Uh, what do you call a sorceress in the desert? Well, a sandwich, of course. So um, just to get things started, uh, we're going to talk about secondary skills as a developer. And it's about becoming an expert in your secondary skills. And why do you want to do that? Because we think it'll give you superpowers as an individual and it'll help in getting you be that uh, 10x developer that was mentioned uh, this morning by Merrowing. So um, we hope to share some non-technical skills with you so that you can develop yourself further as a developer. So a little bit about us. Um, Amos, my colleague over there, he's... Uh, a design lead within, uh, within Stream. He has a lot of experience with designing things and recently he switched to uh, being part of the developer relations team at uh, Stream for iOS. So he's uh, my team member actually and we work together every day. And I myself am uh, the, the lead of the iOS developer relations team. I also do a podcast called App Force One. You might have uh, listened to it uh, once or twice. If you don't, look it up in your uh, podcast player of choice. And I also wrote a book about being a lead developer and there's going to be like a nice discount code on that book at the end of the presentation as well. I've been doing software development for over 20 years, so quite a while, so a lot of experience there. Um, as you've already seen in the video, Stream Chat, that's a nice API you can work with. Uh, come talk to us. Actually, the Hopin platform that we're using at this conference, the chat feature is implemented with our SDK. And uh, there's a number of logos there that you can have a look at and make sure to check out our API and our SDK. And we actually have a code lab available that allows you to uh, gain uh, experience with our product. And also, it, uh, it's, it's a nice giveaway. You can, win a disc no, you can win a coupon code for $200 at the Apple Store. Also, we're hiring a great group of people. A lot of people uh, work remote at Stream. So we're across the, the globe. 140 countries, I think, are represented. Uh, no, 140 people and 50 countries are represented in our uh, in our team at Stream. Uh, two main offices: one in uh, Boulder, Colorado, in the United States, and one in Amsterdam. As I mentioned, the Code Lab. Have a look at it. Um, link will be shared within the uh, chat space of the uh, Hopin uh, platform. So uh, have a look at it. Uh, have some experience, and you can actually. Uh, have a, have a nice price, and we're also giving away some swag uh, to people who submit on this uh, code lab. Um, so yeah, let's uh, get started. Why talk about secondary skills? Um, I should have updated the slides, actually, because we're talking about the React web developer, and uh, there was a presentation earlier about Android developers with Kotlin, and that those skills are pretty much interchangeable. Well, as you, have, uh, as you can see here, as a primary skill as an iOS developer, you have like your language, Xcode, SwiftUI, and with uh, a React web developer, you have some JavaScript, Visual Studio, code maybe, uh, the React framework, of course. But there's also a whole bunch of uh, secondary skills that are important for you as a software developer. And you might notice they're exactly the same for both kinds of developers, right? So whatever you do in your career, your secondary skills are very likely to carry over to whatever you're going to be doing in the future. Um, so, what stays and remains? The secondary skills and um, the primary skills, those are things that change with time. So, uh, for instance, with iOS development, we had manual, manual memory management that switched to Arc. Objective-C went to Swift and UIKit is transitioning to SwiftUI nowadays. So, very likely at the next WWDC, SwiftUI will be much more important for us as iOS developers. So, I expect our skills, our primary skills to change each year and, uh, yeah. You have to try and stay up to date with those things. So change is constant. Um, externally, you will remain. Externally, you will change your code. So it can happen it fast or slow. It doesn't matter really. Um, but just look at the, at the job posting that take your interest uh, nowadays and compare those with the job posting that took your interest like one or two years ago. They're fairly likely to be a little bit different. Um, so and like with any high skilled jobs, the core tools remain. So the skills that you have as an individual, your learning skills, your communication skills, uh, those are things that you carry with you during your entire career. So try and find those skills that, uh, that you can take with you, whatever you do. So projects and environments and where you do your work, those are likely to change. Just look at me. Like a few years ago, I was working in the office and nowadays I work 100% remote, but I still need to communicate, I still need to learn new things, still need to make sure that I uh, do my job to the best of my abilities. And 
Um, when you look at those uh, skills, uh, yeah, they're usually, they're usually usable everywhere that you go. So even if you decide to switch out of software development, there's a lot of those secondary skills that you can take with you. So I think it's good for you to become an expert in your secondary skills uh, because you will gain some superpowers and it actually will help you with uh, being a more productive uh, software developer and team member in whatever project or job that you, took, that you take in the future. Click. Yes. Um, secondary skills. So, first one, it's a bit of a technical one. It's just uh, the tools of your job. Uh, there was a nice presentation earlier uh, on some specific things that you can do to optimize your workflow with your development environment. So that's the Xcode talk that, the, that we've seen, getting some tools integrated within your project that make sure that you actually catch memory leaks, for instance. But uh, I think source control is also one of these tools that you, as a software developer, should be really good at. Um, source control is essential for developers because it allows you to collaborate on code and it's sort of a safety mechanism. It's your safety net. If you make mistakes, you can go back and you can actually uh, well, pretty much share what you're working on. So uh, why should you care about source control? Um, you'll be more productive if you know your version control system in and out, so VCS. Uh, so especially if you know how to work with it because everybody probably knows uh, GitHub or some other uh, similar platform. People know how to commit, people know how to push code, but I noticed with many software developers that's pretty much the extent of their interaction with uh, version control. And there's actually a lot more that you can do there. So those are things like, uh, so with, uh, how do you do that? With version control, it's the hub of your project. I went to the next slide already. But uh, people usually work with GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, uh, similar platforms, and there's a lot of things in there that you should use beyond just simple software and source control. So you have your release management, your build infrastructure nowadays that's quite often integrated with your source control system. And um, the big advantage of these platform-specific features is that they are much more transferable to other projects because uh, every bit of source code needs to be deployed, needs to be built, uh, it needs to be tested, and that's stuff that you want to do on your version control system. And I think pretty much anything that is plain text in your project, you should commit to source control. So I always have a preference to using plain text for anything uh, that I have on a project. So uh, I could put it in version control and actually have versioning on it and share it with my colleagues easily. So how do you do that? Well, I'm really talking about cherry picking, amending, solving merge conflicts and referring. Uh, also the ref lock is something you should look into. Um, if you have questions on those, I can answer those all at the end of the presentation, but I only have like 35 minutes. And uh, branching is also something that you should be able to do because people know how to create a branch, but people often don't know that you can basically pick any uh, commit and create a branch out of that uh, point in time. Uh, doesn't matter if you use a, use a user interface or that you use a command line interface, it's just find whatever what works for you and try and learn about this tool because it's, uh, it's, it's core to your, uh, to your work really. So uh, on top of that, as we already mentioned, that a lot of these version control systems, they provide some sort of uh, CI, CD, so continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, so at some point, uh, as was already mentioned earlier uh, during the presentation, you want to automate the repetitive tasks. So why would you do something manually if you can automate it, especially if it's something that is, um, yeah, something that is uh, automatable, first of all, but also, second of all, something that you uh, can automate is something you cannot make mistakes with. So uh, looking at, for instance, GitHub, you have GitHub Actions. It's quite good at, um, at, at, at allowing you to execute these tasks and um, putting together the components of your product and testing how uh, they work together. So the testing, the integrating, and also the deployment of your product is uh, very easy and worthwhile to do with your, uh, with your built infrastructure that you have available with your version control system. So as already mentioned, why do you want to do this? Uh, you want to automate the integration and delivery of your, uh, of your software, and you want to make sure that you, decre that you decrease the amount of wasted time. So that's the, what if you could gain like one hour each day uh, with automating things, that's like very worthwhile because it's just immediate productivity that you can spend on other tasks and things you want to work on. So uh, it also helps you with uh, maintaining your product's uh, stability because anything that's automatically tested is something you uh, will signal it on if there's an error or an is issue in there. And uh, integrating and building and releasing is often something that uh, gives you all kinds of errors, especially if you do it manual. Um, I don't know how many of you actually tried to uh, automatically uploading to the, the App Store compared to, uh, to uh, manual uploading to the App Store. I've noticed that if you do it manually, 
it's, it's always an issue with every release uh, that you do because there's always something that's forgotten or something that's going wrong, so why not automate that? Uh, how do you do that? Well, the CI CD pipeline removes all kinds of uh, repetitive tasks and moves your focus to the creative side of your work so you can just forget about the releasing stuff, about building the stuff and testing the stuff and you just can focus on your features, focus on your development and make sure that, well, basically you add more complexity to your, uh, to your product. And um, yeah, so think about what things you can automate and how you can automate them. And if you do something for a third time, that's a rule I always apply, you automate it. So three strikes and something's out, right? And uh, if your version control system offers some sort of a continuous integration functionality, uh, well, you can use it in your workflow and you try and avoid introducing new tools because uh, if, you're, if you're on GitHub, why would you try and use another uh, provider for your uh, CI CD infrastructure if it's already offered by a platform that you're using? It, it only adds complexity. Um, so yeah, uh, agile development is also something that uh, we work on uh, quite often within uh, Stream. Um, so Agile is how you do things, it's, it's a process, while within many companies it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very rigid, so you, you have to do these things, you have to produce these artifacts, uh, you know, uh, people get certified scrum professionals, I'm like, how can you be certified in, in following a process? Um, being Agile to me means that you are able to adapt and that you are not tied down to some sort of methodology uh, because of what I call reasons. Uh, it's good to be aware of, of things like Scrum and other Agile methodologies, but it should not be taken as something that is to be performed literally and like to the letter and um, yeah, in a way that it's very rigid instead of very flexible in providing the tools that you need to, to be able to do your job. So being Agile is about evaluating where you are right now and based on those uh, evaluations, make sure what's the be next best thing to do. So uh, Agile really re tries to reduce risk by allowing you to figure out what's the next best thing to focus at. Uh, that's also why these short sprints, these short iterations are uh, done with uh, Agile development because if you have like a short planning window, uh, you're not tied to a certain direction of your work for longer than that planning window because uh, you often see with Agile development, or a company calls it Agile, they have like iterations and then uh, they pretty much just plan out like an entire quarter, okay, with this sprint we're gonna do this, that sprint we're gonna do that, then we're gonna do this. If your company does that, they do not understand agile development because if you look further in software development than like one or two weeks, um, you're not agile anymore. It, it's fine if you do that methodology, but please call it what it is, it's called waterfall. So um, you wanna have this short feedback cycle because that allows you to be flexible, right? So uh, it also allows you to clearly communicate what you're doing uh, because uh, you're working on a window of two weeks and you're focusing on that and you're not trying to do anything beyond those two weeks. Of course, you have to do some prep work for the next sprint, but that's it. That's the amount of planning that you really need to do. So I think Agile is much more a mindset instead of uh, some recipe that you need to follow for success. Uh, so, but if you're in a company, of course, you can try and be Agile in the way that I describe it. But be careful with that because uh, quite often these jobs uh, in big corporations, it's quite ingrained within the company. You get like these uh, scalable agile frameworks. That's like uh, even worse than uh, a company following uh, agile to the letter of Scrum, for, ex for example. Uh, but uh, I've seen these, uh, these pictures. It's like a very huge wall size poster. And then what you do as a software developer is right down in the right corner at the bottom, uh, like this small area and all the rest is just I don't know really what it is. Um, so yeah, agile development, it's about small increments, short cycles, you evaluate, you adapt, and you implement your uh, evaluations, your results. So I think resources to read are like the pragmatic programmers uh, that's at pragproc.com. There's a link uh, later in the slides. And uh, yeah, the hard and soft skills, some things are process, that's like soft skills, and some things are engineering practices, that's the hard skills, for instance. If you wanna be agile, you have to make sure that you use version control properly, and you have to make sure that you actually use uh, CI, CD properly, because that allows you to accelerate, that allows you to take risks and uh, be quick uh, and, uh, and, and correct when implementing new features. Uh, next up is uh, Amos, he will uh, talk about some topics uh, that he is very familiar with.
Okay, let's talk about why you need um, a learning mindset as a secondary skill. So, uh, as a developer, you may uh, have a professional education in a certain area, and uh, you may think that is enough. But uh, that is not enough in this world of constant change. Um, this means you need to follow trends, both in your uh, study field and also outside of, of that. And uh, mainly, uh, it can also be in your work area as well. This will allow you to be able to figure out the new skills that you are just interested in. So why will you even bother to uh, learn about anything? So uh, in this world, there is a lot of competition. So if you want to stay on top of competition, then it means you have to uh, have a learning mindset. Um, learning a new skill will also al allow you um, to be creative and get inspired. And if you get inspired, you can also use that inspiration uh, and apply it in many areas of your work. It will also um, help you if you are working in a team. It will assist you to be able to provide valuable contributions to your team. So sometimes um, you may have the commitment to just uh, uh, learn, but uh, you, you don't even know where to start from. Um, what you have to do is to do personal sort analysis. So this will allow you to identify your strength and um, areas where you have weakness. So I'll take myself as an example here. When it was time for me to move from the design team at Stream to join the iOS developer relations team, I did a personal SWOT analysis and identified that uh, I have to just uh, uh, improve my skills in Swift. So to be able to um, learn successfully also, it needs your commitment. And uh, you need to also allocate time to just do that. And also, you also need to make it a habit of learning. And if you are working with a company, um, you can check with the HR to see if they have a learning package as a pick. So um, you may buy a book and want to learn about, um, for example, a course, or get a budget for uh, studying some concept. This is not the same thing as uh, learning. To be able to learn successfully, um, you need to get your hands dirty and do the actual work. For, for example, after joining the iOS developer relations team, I noticed that I have to just improve my skills in Swift. So I had to just subscribe to uh, the 100 days of Swift UI from hacking with Swift. It is also good if you are able to communicate with your manager to be able to allocate time for you to just learn and improve the area that you want to get improvement. And sometimes too, you can just learn by following uh, your curiosity or experimenting with new things without having a clear goal. For example, by participating in um, local meetups, or you can try an interesting API or just um, try a new framework or learn a new language as well. It doesn't also need to be um, the field that you are working. It can just be playing a piano. So just remember uh, how you learned where, when you were a kid. So uh, you may have the commitment to learn, but um, sometimes uh, as you start to learn, you may come up with some frustrations and uh, confusion on the way. So when this happens, what you have to do is to use the um, learning pit platform uh, fr framework as a form of encouragement. So for example, you may want to learn a concept in Swift, and you, you may find it very confusing. But you don't need to give up. Um, what you have to do is to just uh, find different type of resources to get started. And uh, also, maybe you, you may know someone who is more interested in the concept. And you, you can just consult to help out. Once you do that, you will be able to move from the surface learning to a um, deep understanding of the concept. And this is where your joy comes from.
So um, another secondary skill as a developer you can add to your belt is learning about design. As a developer, you don't need to be very good in design, but getting um, the basic understanding of design will go a long way to help you in your development process. It can just be learning about how fonts work or uh, learning about the uh, properties required to create an effective font. You can start with the um, Apple Human Interface guidelines, for example. It has uh, a lot of documentation about um, how to de design your iOS apps, for example. There is also another talk coming right after this talk from Jane about uh, UI, UX design basics for iOS developers. So you, you can just check it out. So why will you even bother to learn? As developers, we are uh, most of the time collaborating with uh, designers. So having the basic understanding of design will help you to be able to collaborate effectively with um, designers. We are also building apps all the time. So having a basic understanding of design will help you to bring consistency across your screens. And uh, there is one principle of design that says uh, form must follow function. And uh, there is nothing also that says um, this, function, this form cannot be uh, beautiful. So if you have the fundamentals of design, you will be able to make your app look more beautiful uh, and look good and make it usable as well. For example, you, uh, you, you can have uh, familiarity with uh, accessibility. This will allow you to be able to um, consider people with different abilities when designing or uh, developing your apps. So you can check the Apple developer website for more details about accessibility. So how do you start learning about design? Um, as I said before, you can start to read about the Apple Human Interface Guidelines. It is a big document, but uh, it is well written. For example, they have a section which has more visual examples. So you can just check that. The, there is also a section about typography and the basics of um, font metrics. So you can refer to that and learn about how fonts work. Sometimes also you can get um, inspiration for, from your favorite existing apps. So a good website for that is mobin.design. So you can check it up to see how most of the popular apps are designed. So communication is also another secondary skill you can add to your belt as a developer. So your ability to communicate well with others depends on the way you speak, the way you write, and the way you share whatever you are working on. And this can be in the form of a message, conversation. Um, it can be giving and receiving feedback. The code you write and how you document it as well. It can be uh, attending meetings, emails, or a Slack conversation. So to be able to communicate well, um, you need to do it constantly. And uh, uh, so let's look at why you need uh, communication as a secondary skills. So the, uh, this is something we do daily. So being good at it is really helpful. It will allow you to communicate well with others. And uh, if you have good communication skills, it will allow you to build relationship with other people, both personally and um, professionally. And sharing about um, what you are working on will also help you uh, to, uh, it will help your teammates, for example, to know about what you are working on and your line manager will know the workload um, that involves in what you are working on as well. So communication doesn't need to be only about speaking or, uh, or communicating with somebody else. Uh, it is all, all also about the code you write. For, for example, if you write a code and you don't document it well, uh, if you come back after two weeks, it will be really hard to know what you have, you, you have just written. So how do you communicate well? Uh, one way is to treat um, communication as uh, an 
engineering a practice called don't repeat yourself. This will allow you to reduce repetition of patterns um, when coding or using a language. So when you want to communicate, it is good to always start with an outline. This will allow you to know um, what you want to say before saying that. Uh, especially if you are working in async teams, um, over communication is the best way to start. When you work in an async team, um, you, you have to always decide how you can just share your message. For example, if you have a big message, you have to choose the medium through which you share the message carefully. If you have a big message, you can store it as a permanent message. So uh, this can be in the form of a wiki, or you can use a tool like Notion. Also, if, if, you have, uh, if the message is in the form of documentation, you can use um, a, a documentation repository for storing the information. This will allow you to keep tracking um, of all the histories or all the ch changes you, you make in the documentation. And you also get insight into why things are done the way they are. So when communicating, you also, uh, f for example, if you want to start a meeting, you need to have a clear goal wh about when the meeting starts. And this can be shared with all the participants attending the me a meeting. And this will allow you them to also agree upon um, what the meeting is about. And before you start a meeting, it is good to also know what the meeting is about by just reading about the email sent for the meeting and the description in the um, message. When you have a meeting, it is good to uh, make sure everyone in the meeting has a voice. For example, you may be the most loudest voice in the room, but that doesn't mean you have to just um, take over the meeting all the time. You have to give um, the chance for introverted people as well. So feedback, uh, giving and receiving feedback is a um, very um, challenging experience. So if you need to give feedback to others, uh, try to make it more concise because generalized feedback is not always helpful. When, uh, you need to also treat feedback as a way to boost your skills and your learning opportunities. And most of the time, people may do a really great job. So uh, then you need to just praise them. And if you have to do that, you have to do it in public and uh, both in person. And also, you can just communicate that through your line manager. Uh, if you have to give constructive feedback, you have to be really careful about that. Um, because your tone matters in, the, in this spot. Um, people will never forget about how you make them feel. So if you have to give a constructive feed feedback, it has to be more supportive. In most of the time, you will also be receiving feedback from others. So whether it is good or bad, um, you just need to listen to the feedback, what it is about, because it will help you to improve um, you are hidden spots. So being an effective team player is also another secondary skills a developer can add to his or her belt. So if you are an effective team player, it will allow you to provide valuable contribution to your team. So, and um, if you are an effective team player, you will be more appreciated by your team as well. And to be an effective team player, you need to appreciate the work of others, like um, the people you are just working with. So if you take a look at any effective team, you, you can see the, the team is able to provide more um, outcomes than the individual or uncoordinated groups. So uh, why do you want to be uh, it, an effective team player or a strong team player. So this will allow you to create an, an 
an inclusive environment. So always remember to uh, create a diverse environment where people will feel like they belong to your team. And you should try not to um, dislike people uh, all, all the time or don't dislike people unreasonably because um, prejudice is uh, something we all have. So just reflect upon that and just act accordingly. So uh, how do you be an effective team player? So this is one of the attributes of an effective team player. Um, that is trustworthiness. You have to, uh, if you need your team members to trust you, you have to also trust them as well. And if you need to attend a meeting or just do a task, try to just do it on, on time. If you are in doubt or if something uh, uh, uncertain happens, try to just, uh, uh, or if you have to maybe uh, reschedule a meeting, try to do it on, on, on time rather than to wait until maybe 30 minutes to, to, to the meeting when you just want to change it. And to be an effective team player, you need to support the work of others too. It is also more about an implied, uh, uh, implied trust. So you have to trust the work others people will also do. Sometimes it requires you to just um, follow some basic rules like um, the Pac-Man rule at conferences. Um, they, they saw, uh, uh, if you are just standing in a group or you have an event, try to just create an impression that people can also join. This is, this is going to be fun because uh, I'm looking at the time and uh, my next topic is uh, time management. So um, time management, what is it? It's about making sure that you work on what is important to you because quite often people work on things that seems to be the most pressing thing right now. So when in a job it's about to work in a task that you are actually paid to do and quite often you can get sniped with things that is not your core task and then when evaluations uh, come by every quarter, every half year, every year, people think you didn't do anything while you were busy with something that I like to call glue work. It is important but it's those small tasks that are quite often not your core task and it is uh, often not recognized uh, within companies. So. Also, when you are self-employed, it's about making sure that you do the work that pays the bills because you can do calls, all kinds of things, but if you neglect the work that actually brings home the bacon, then yeah, uh, at some point you cannot be self-employed uh, anymore, right? So, uh, what is time management about? Why? Um, yeah, it's important to know what is important and to schedule the time for that so that you always know uh, when you are off track because quite often if you don't know what you're supposed to be working on, how can you actually be aware that you are not working on the thing you are supposed to work on. So non-core non work is important. It keeps you sane and a well-rounded individual, but make sure that you take the time for those things when it is the right time to do those things. So remember to schedule time for learning, exploring, communicating and breaks and focused work. Because if you do that, then you also gain the benefit that when you're working on the thing that you have planned yourself to work on, that you actually feel comfortable working on it, and at the end of the day, you actually feel that you have actually achieved something. So um, that's about many jobs. Sometimes you have these days, at the end of the job, you look back and you say, uh, what did I actually achieve today? And uh, I was in meetings all day, I didn't achieve anything. Well, if that's what you plan to do that day, then you had a perfect job, uh, you did a perfect day, because you achieved what you set out to do that day, right? So planning your day in advance, it tells you when you really have to uh, look back and say that you have a wasted day or not, because it's, it's, it's important to feel fulfilled at the end of the day. And you can do that with scheduling your own time. So why and how time management? If you are not aware of what you are planning to work on, it is very hard to say no when you should actually say no. Uh, saying yes to too many things is uh, the thing that leads you to being overwhelmed and it will actually in the long run burn you out. So. I think it's a very important skill that you know the simple word, no. If somebody asks you to do something uh, on a whim, say no. Say, say, send me an email and I will look if I can schedule some time for it. 
Uh, so that's again that a lot of tasks are glue work. So that's you, somebody asks you, hey, can you like inform this customer? Uh, why should I inform this customer? You're on this task, finish the task. Do the communication with this customer yourself. Empower them to do that if that's not the culture within the company. Um, so handing off work is quite often the thing that, uh, that takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. And quite often, if people can actually just finish the, the whole task themselves, then it's, it's more efficient, there's less glue work, and uh, people are more happy, and uh, people feel more, feel more empowered. Um, so always ask yourself, should you be the one doing this thing? Um, so uh, take care of distractions like email, chat, and all that stuff as well. So if you're in an organization that's like everything is an email, well, just open the email like in the morning at the end of the day and in between, if there's an email that is uh, coming by, well, you'll see it at the end of the day. If it's that important, why would they send an email and not go to your desk or call you, right? Uh, quite often things are much less important than if individuals sending the message actually thinks it is. So be careful and mindful about your own priorities and your own time. And the same goes for chat and Slack because Slack, very convenient, very Nice to be in direct communication with all your, uh, all your peers, but it's a huge distraction as well. So if you put it on do not disturb, because you're focused on something, make sure that you're not disturbed. And if somebody does disturb you, they make sure that they understand that they have to have a really good reason for doing so. Because our job as software developers is being focused on writing code, being able to focus for prolonged durations so that you can actually get some work done, right? And what I also noticed is that if you actually don't respond to people for some reason, magically, they're quite often able to just help themselves. And then the issue that they came in communication with you uh, is something that they solve themselves. And you quite often get a follow-up communication like a half an hour later. Yeah, I was able to fix it. Don't need your help anymore. Problem solved, right? So book time in your schedule. If you want to do focus work, what I often do, if I want to do some work on uh, Wednesday morning, I just, I just book a meeting for four hours in my schedule on Wednesday and nobody touches that time slot because that's when I'm doing some focused work. And if you interrupt my focus work, I'm not worthwhile as an individual, as an employee. So it, yeah, it's, it's your choice if you want to disturb me there, but uh, that's what, uh, what happens then. Um, it's a conscious choice that somebody breaks your focus time. So schedule, the, schedule your day the day before or even earlier, and hardly anything is important enough to uh, require a meeting half an hour from now, because uh, those are the most uh, unproductive uh, meetings that you can have, so that those, those things that are scheduled on a whim, unless like the building is on fire or your biggest customer is about to uh, cancel their uh, contract with you. So learn to say no. It's okay to have enough work so you can't take more. Uh, keeping a healthy workload increases your productivity because you're not like overwhelmed all the time. And if, your job, if in our job more results do not scale with the amount of time that you spend. It's, it's quite weird, but I reach a limit every week. That's the amount of work that I can do. That's the amount of work I fit in my brain. And then uh, anything else I try to push in there doesn't work anymore. So uh, note taking, I will go through this one really quick because uh, Lucy is like waving at me all the time. <laughs> um, and we have lunch in a, in a few minutes. Uh, take notes on pretty much anything that you do because it's like a secondary storage that you can use to like improve your own, uh, your own life really. So make notes during meetings, uh, make, do make notes um, of your day-to-day -day work, I engineering challenges that you work on, engineering issues that you run into, um, and just really on anything and everything that you do. And make sure, uh, because note taking, it decreases your retention and it allows you to come back to concept later more easily because you, you can just scroll to your notes and have a, an idea of what you want to work on. And um, it also allows you to process your day as a separate activity. So you have like a day's worth of notes. I always like to take some time, 15 minutes, half an hour, depends on what I did that day, but to just go over my, no uh, my notes and just skim through and find the important things and sometimes even rewrite uh, parts of my notes. Um, so if you take notes, it doesn't matter if you do it digitally or in, uh, on paper, just do whatever works for you. And uh, make sure to take the time each day to process it because uh, you can then throw out what's not important um, and you can archive the things that are important and you can also rewrite and restructure and do the follow-up that you want to do on things that you actually promised throughout, uh, throughout the entire day. So, and once you have processed your notes, I think it's very important to, to hang on to those because that's like, uh, well, Amazon S3 calls it glacier storage, but it's pretty much the same concept. Uh, it takes some effort, but you can always go back to your process notes uh, afterwards, even a year from now. So, quick recap. Uh, there's a number of tool belt items that we discussed, exactly nine actually. And there, of course, are many more 
things that, uh, that you can use, uh, so large and small, to uh, improve your day-to-day uh, -day life as a software developer. And uh, don't forget about CodeLab that we mentioned. And there's also a number of uh, books that are really good resources to, to learn about, more about this topic. That's the Pragmatic Programmer book linked here and uh, a book that I wrote myself also linked here. Uh, the book Lead Developer. Um, there's, uh, there's two discount codes that you can use because Lucy said she likes books uh, yesterday. And uh, the first discount code, it only works nine times, is Swift Swift Heroes. And it gives you a free copy of the book. So start typing now, people, because there's an online group as well in competition with you. And uh, if that one doesn't work anymore, then use the discount code Swift Heroes because it gives you a nine, uh, I think it's a dollar uh, discount on the book. And it's, it's, it's more than half uh, of the uh, price of the book that's discounted then. So thank you. And uh, 